Great. Thank you, Klaus. Thanks, uh, everyone, for uh, having me. This is uh, a great uh, pleasure to uh, return to this uh, respected uh, forum and uh, share a little bit about uh, thoughts on the writing libraries uh, in C plus plus twenty, where we have uh, this uh, great new feature of concepts. And uh, I'll try to uh, tell you a little bit, not just about that, but uh, in general about uh, different ways for library writers to uh, communicate and interact with uh, whoever uses them. So. Uh, let's start with a short introduction uh, 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 to introduce uh, concepts and uh, uh, the fact that uh, they are here uh, with a relatively old uh, video from uh, 2014. Uh, and here's a, a short clip from a class uh, by Alexander Stepanov, the, uh, the, the person who actually wrote and implemented the, the STL. And uh, we can see how in 2014 concepts were uh, used. So let's uh, hear that. Okay, so we have a whole bunch of uh, concepts that we've used in all of our code, and these all defines to type name. Right? This is just documentation today. Maybe at some point there will be a way in the language to express this, but but today in that's two the way it is. Okay, so uh, I hope uh, you heard, and you can see that even in 2014, long before we had concepts in the language, library authors uh, already started their thinking about concepts, and they didn't have any mechanism outside of the preprocessor and define. Uh, to convert the word the type name into uh, names of concepts, but they did use it even then to write their code, to reason about their code, even without uh, uh, compiler support. And happily now in the C++ 20, we know that uh, we don't need these and we can actually write uh, the name of a concept in, and replace the type name inside our templates uh, to get uh, some more functionality. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll understand uh, why and how it uh, helps us. And uh, I want to give you another introduction. Sorry. Another short uh, introduction, even from the same class, but from a year earlier, uh, from uh, Bjorn Strasstrup himself. Uh, also, uh, uh, he talked about uh, concepts even then. And uh, let's hear him tell us a little bit about uh, the importance of this uh, feature. Uh, concepts are fundamental. They're, they're meant to have represent uh, fundamental concepts in the application area. Uh, Alex has been saying this for at least 15 years, but most people haven't gotten it. Um, concept okay, so concepts are fundamental. Alex has been saying it for years, and uh, Strasserup also thinks that. So they're fundamental. If uh, any of you, uh, you know, know about C20 and haven't uh, uh, dived deep into uh, concepts, maybe this is a good opportunity. Because as they say, it, it seems that it's important. So. Uh, why is it important? Let's uh, look a little bit at uh, a little bit of uh, motivating example. So it, a lot of it has to do with templates. Okay, uh, here's a, good, a short example of a very very simple uh, template uh, algorithm, the min algorithm that finds uh, the minimum of two elements. You can see that this is a template. It works on any type uh, AT, and it actually uh, just needs uh, us to, uh, to be able to compare uh, two objects of the type T, and uh, this uh, algorithm. Will just work and give us uh, re return the minimum. Very very simple and very very easy. Um, and things uh, start to get a little more complicated when we use uh, techniques like meta programming. Uh, when we want uh, the same algorithm implemented, may maybe in various in various ways, or if uh, uh, this, the algorithm isn't relevant, maybe for for every type T uh, that we want to work with. So in this example, uh, the swap algorithm, you can see it it, it has in the STL a default uh, implementation for every type T, and then there's a specialization for uh, arrays of constant size. Uh, the specialization in this case copies the array uh, element by element, and this is something that uh, uh, is, we don't want uh, copying uh, uh, pointers or anything like that, so uh, this specialization is important, and this is uh, a way, a small uh, metaprogramming trick uh, to basically give two algorithms that uh, have the exact same meaning, uh, the same name, and uh, let the compiler choose the correct uh, implementation for us. Okay, another uh, example uh, of such a thing is uh, not for uh, uh, to get a, a different uh, algorithm, but uh, maybe the same algorithm but with different uh, properties, like uh, like better performance. So in this example, this one is from deep down inside the, the STL, and it's uh, some uh, metaprogramming trick called enable if that is used to implement. Uh, the STD fill algorithm specifically 
in the case that uh, we want to uh, uh, to fill uh, an array of bytes. Okay, so if uh, you want to fill uh, point uh, pointers uh, to bytes, uh, the STL implementer goes ahead and tells the compiler we want to this to run this special algorithm that simply does a memset. Okay, so uh, one would think that uh, the default implementation of fill is something that is like a for loop that goes and assigns uh, uh, the same value to every element. And a good compiler might uh, convert such a thing into a memset in case of an array of bytes. But uh, this uh, uh, trick allows uh, the library implementer to basically force the hand of uh, the compiler and make sure that uh, the, compil the compiler has to do a memset and nothing uh, other than that. OK, so these are a little bit of motivating examples why uh, uh, writing different algorithms with different properties uh, can, can make sense and uh, where we want uh, maybe the compiler to help us choose the correct one. Okay, so uh, after this uh, maybe short introduction, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what's uh, coming ahead. Uh, I'll tell you in, in this talk more about uh, the ways to put constraints on templates and to uh, tell uh, our compiler and our users uh, which algorithms uh, we wrote and uh, which, with which types that they have uh, the, the algorithms are best used with. We'll obviously talk a little bit about uh, the ways that C20 concepts are used. How, uh, uh, how, how to use them briefly, and I'll show uh, other ways and alternatives that we had uh, before C20 and are sometimes useful even today. I will uh, tell you a lot about uh, things that, uh, that I think. Uh, some of it uh, are, are facts, many are opinions. You may disagree with me, of course, and you can feel free to, uh, to ask questions and make comments. I'll be happy to learn. Uh, I'll try to give uh, some uh, tips and ideas on, on ways to use different mechanisms and even uh, uh, give some examples of places where I think uh, the language itself might be, might be less than ideal and uh, uh, what, what I think about that. In the talk, I'll uh, uh, put uh, some snippets like the ones that I've shown so far uh, from the SDL and I'll try to show a few uh, clips uh, from YouTube like I did uh, as well to try and make things uh, interesting and uh, may also give you pointers uh, to, to learn more on yourselves. Okay, so uh, let's uh, dive in and uh, see a little uh, more clearly what, uh, what concepts are actually about. So again, from that uh, same talk uh, in, from 2013, let's uh, hear uh, one of the uh, descriptions that Trostrup says about uh, this uh, feature. And the thing we were working on is it becomes a bunch of constant expressions. It becomes a bunch of Boolean expressions. Does this type have this property? Does the argument type has this property? Has the combination of types we get as arguments got this property? It's all predicates. It's all Boolean algebra. Um, there's nothing about scopes, nothing about objects, nothing about uh, indirect jump tables. It's all Boolean expressions. Okay, so if we start thinking about concepts, we just need to remember it's all Boolean expressions, predicates on types. That's uh, the basic heart of what concepts are. So now that we know what they are, where should we use them? Again, let's uh, hear a, a short clip from the same lecture from uh, the Arnest Trust Group. You can overload if it meets the sets of constraints from one and not the other. That's the story. If it meets, if they are subsets of each other, then it'll take the one you, uh, the, the biggest one it can. In, in other words, if you, most specific. Well, the one that, ha that, that meets the, the largest number of the predicate. You can all. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the basic uh, way to use uh, uh, concepts. Uh, we have uh, various uh, uh, objects, various algorithms. Each of them has their own constraints, and uh, they are all used uh, for overloading. And the compiler will choose the one with the best number, with the largest number of uh, matching uh, predicates. We'll see more of that uh, a little later on. And uh, the last uh, thing, let's leave uh, uh, Bjorn alone and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about one third thing uh, that is important to know about concepts, and that is uh, uh, an, an excerpt from a, a CPP reference. This is their introduction to the concepts library in C20. And uh, these are three very interesting sentences, but I would like to focus on just a few words relating to the 
uh, not just the syntactic, but also the semantic requirements or concepts. So concepts uh, are actually a, a set of uh, syntax requirements, but and also semantic requirements. And uh, the compiler basically uh, is used to check uh, for syntax, but uh, we uh, should always remember uh, semantics because if the semantic requirements are not met, the point of use, even if a code compiles, it's considered informed, it's considered undefined behavior. So we should always keep that in mind. Okay, so these are basically three uh, uh, main uh, points from my uh, perspective of how to think about concepts. Okay, so it's a bunch of Boolean expressions. In case of overloads, uh, the compiler knows to take the one that meets the largest number of predicates. And uh, uh, when we uh, use and uh, write concepts, we think uh, not just of syntax, but also of semantics. Okay, and basically, uh, the rest of the talk, we'll just dive in to these uh, three uh, uh, topics to understand uh, what, each, what each of them means. Um, maybe this is a good uh, point uh, uh, to maybe stop and see if anyone has uh, questions or comments. So we don't have any um, questions so far. Please go on. Okay, great. So let's uh, dive into the first uh, topic, uh, a bunch of Boolean expressions. So um, the basic way to uh, write a concept and the, the most, uh, one of the most trivial concepts to, uh, to write is a concept that is just equal to a Boolean, okay? So is integral V, something that existed uh, for a long time in C++, it's a Boolean uh, over a type, and uh, we can write a concept that is just equal to that uh, uh, Boolean, okay? And that's the basic way to write a new concept. If you want to go and uh, be a little more, uh, uh, more advanced, we can start using uh, Boolean expressions. Okay, so sine integral, for example, is a Boolean expression, an end condition between uh, uh, two other Booleans. STD integral is a concept by itself. E sine V is another Boolean uh, that existed uh, uh, even before C20. And uh, even in this example, we can see that there is this notion of how many uh, you know, sub expressions there are in a, in a concept. And right here, we can see that uh, sine integral has a, a two sub-components or two sub-expressions, whereas integral has just one. And for that reason, a sign integral is ranked higher or ranked before integral in case uh, of, a, uh, of a race or a, of, of places where a compiler needs to choose which of those two uh, concepts to use, okay? Uh, the third way to uh, define concepts might be uh, the most exciting one, has to do with the uh, requires expressions, okay? So requires expressions is a, a new uh, construct in C++. And it's a way to basically convert uh, C++ uh, arbitrary expressions and statements into Boolean uh, uh, algebra, okay? And the way it goes, you write uh, just the, the word requires, uh, put in some arguments uh, based on, on your templates, and inside curly braces, you can put whatever expression you want. Those expressions will not be executed. They will just be uh, verified by the compiler to see if they're uh, legal C++, okay, if they, can, if they are they're meaningful, if, if they can be uh, executed if need be, okay? And if they are, then this uh, requires expression becomes true. And if not, this requires expression will become false and it won't cause any uh, compilation failure or, or, or error, okay? So and this is a very uh, nice way to basically uh, convert um, a what if question, is a certain code possible to write? Is it okay to, uh, to write a certain, uh, a type of code converted into a Boolean that tells us a lot about the syntax and about the ways that uh, our objects uh, can be used. Okay, so these are the, the three basic ways to define your own concepts. They're all very nice. But if we uh, go before C20, we can see that all of these three aren't really new, right? Uh, we had uh, other ways to do very, very similar things even before. So as we saw, uh, even on the previous slide, type traits are something that existed for a long time. And the uh, type trait uh, usually is uh, a template that has a colon colon value uh, a member that is a Boolean. And then in this uh, example, yeah, a bool constant is, is a type trait. And we can uh, set things up such that uh, this bool constant will be a true or false in various conditions. So uh, for example, uh, so, so that's uh, one way. Um, template, uh, variable templates can also be used there uh, to convert uh, types into Booleans. Okay, so this is a, uh, an example actually for C20, but it, we could have done this uh, even before, uh, where enable borrowed range is just a, a, a Boolean const expert template on the class R, and it's, it's just default, it just defaults to false, okay? This is another way to uh, create a, a Boolean out of a type. Okay? By the way, we don't have to do it with constepter 
variables. We can also do it with the context of functions. Um, if it uh, is templated on a type and returns a bool, then it's a, it's a Boolean expression, right? And uh, uh, another thing that uh, we obviously had before is uh, combinations of uh, Boolean algebra and, and Boolean operators. So in this example, is scalar is just a, a type trait that is defined by some uh, Boolean expression over other type traits. And this is all, these are all things that uh, existed before. Um, as we can see, concepts uh, uh, aren't really borrowed from that uh, uh, mechanism, but aren't, uh, isn't really new. Um, the last uh, mechanism that I showed uh, in the last slide, the required expression, also seems very, very uh, um, uh, nice and, and, uh, and shiny. But even that isn't uh, really something that was impossible before that. Okay, this uh, um, some of you know the uh, acronym SFINE, which stands for substitution failure is not an error. And uh, I won't uh, dive too much uh, into it, but I can show you this uh, small trick that can be used uh, to replace uh, requires expressions even before uh, C plus twenty. In this uh, example, we, we have a trait called has meow which will uh, de be defined to false for every uh, type that we template on it, unless we can uh, call a dot meow method on the object of type T. So every object uh, of type T that has a meow method uh, will have its has meow uh, equals to true, okay? And every other object will have its has meow equal to false. So this is a parallel to uh, a requires expression that tries to uh, call meow on, on an object, but it existed even before C20, and we could have used it. So basically, uh, one can look at uh, all the new uh, concept mechanisms and, and say that uh, this is maybe not too interesting because uh, we could do everything even before C20. And uh, there is some truth to that, but also, obviously, some things are, uh, are more tricky. Um, on, on top of uh, these uh, uh, things and these parallels to the ways uh, to write concepts, there are also other approaches to do predicates on types that existed before C20 and don't have direct uh, parallels in the concepts world. First and first, foremost is specialization, okay? Um, specialization and partial specialization was a way that existed and still exists to convert uh, types into Booleans. And is const is one example. You can see that again, every type uh, is not const unless it is const, okay? So this is a very uh, you know, simple uh, case of partial specialization. I should note that concepts themselves cannot be specialized, okay? Um, uh, but uh, uh, so this way of specialization exists for type traits, but not for concepts. Um, another uh, uh, way uh, to, uh, uh, I guess, to, to convert uh, types to uh, predicates, which is very similar to what we saw before, is just uh, by doing uh, opt-in and opt-out types of things. We already saw this example of enable board range equals false. And some of you might look at it and, and uh, think that it's, uh, it seems meaningless, right? Uh, if, if it's always equals to false, why, why does the STL have it? What, what's the meaning of that? But uh, uh, the meaning is basically to allow any uh, application that uses the STL to go ahead and specialize um, this uh, Boolean for its own uh, uh, classes and for its own uh, objects and, and, and basically turn it into true, okay? So enable borrowed range is something that's always false unless the user of the STL decides that they have their own class and they want to make it uh, true for themselves. Okay, so this is another way um, that uh, uh, is, can be used to convert types into Booleans. And again, as I mentioned, concepts themselves cannot be specialized. Okay, so if uh, I was not working with uh, type traits, like before C++20, and I had defined the uh, isConst, enable borrowed range, et cetera, as concepts, I could have done it, but, but without specialization. I could not have used specialization. I could not have uh, given uh, uh, my users the ability to uh, specialize or override the library's decision. Because concepts themselves uh, are typically, uh, you know, can be composed of other Boolean expressions, one can say that uh, this uh, lack of specialization isn't uh, too painful and isn't too, uh, too much of a problem because if someone writes their concept as something that is equal to a type trait, then the type trait can be specialized and the concept uh, will you know, transitively be uh, specialized as well. Um, another mechanism uh, that exists uh, uh, and existed before C20 
it's just using uh, traits, uh, not just type traits, uh, and, and basically converting, uh, uh, giving some, uh, I guess, attributes to whatever types I want. Uh, an example of that is uh, the numeric limits in, in STL. Numeric limits are uh, defined for many uh, numeric types inside the C++ language, and it is allowed for, for to anyone that writes their own numeric class to specialize the numeric limits uh, uh, template with their own uh, um, objects and define their own booleans as well as other traits uh, for their own class. Okay, so for example, has infinity is something that uh, is part of the numeric limits, and anyone who writes their own numeric type can uh, basically use this mechanism to tell the world whether their own numeric type has infinity or not. Okay, so that's uh, my main uh, uh, description of uh, ways of uh, converting types into Boolean expressions, and uh, we're ready to dive into the second uh, uh, topic. Again, maybe let's uh, see if anyone has uh, comments or uh, questions. So there's no questions in the chat right now, but I'm so bold to ask a question myself. Um, you mentioned Sfine, and now of course C plus 20 concepts. Are they functionally equivalent, or would you say that there's differences? Hmm. It's a good question. I think we'll see a, a few examples uh, ahead of us, but I would say that first and first more, first foremost, uh, concepts are considered Sfine friendly. Okay, as we mentioned, in case. Uh, something inside the concept resolution or inside a requires expression uh, doesn't uh, compile or is it informed, it, it will not break the compilation itself. So in that case, it is equivalent. I think uh, um, in general, you could, I, I think there are uh, sort of like proofs that uh, whatever you can do with one, you can do with the other, but still, uh, but still concepts are considered more, uh, uh, both easier, uh, with better compilation times mm -hmm. and uh, and more, uh, I guess, uh, useful to to work with, to reason about, etc. I, I think I'm I'm not sure, but I think that functionality they they should be uh, very very close to each other if you're willing to to go through the pain of spinning. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Great. So uh, the second topic is about uh, as you mentioned the the operation of choosing between different overloads. Okay, and choosing between different overloads is. Uh, in, in my opinion, first and foremost, about the interaction and the communication between a library, uh, um, obviously a template library, and its application, okay, the, the applications that use the library. Um, whenever I write a library and, and, or I use a library, uh, there's always a risk of errors and bugs because I have uh, incorrect expectations, okay? Uh, the library expects to uh, uh, work and to uh, receive specific uh, types of arguments that uh, adhere to specific uh, uh, rules. And uh, if uh, the application gives it something else, then uh, you know bad problems can happen. It's a, it's a big, big source of bugs. To a large extent, the fact that C++ is a statically typed language, the compiled language where types are uh, checked uh, at, comp at, at compilation, uh, is really uh, in order to try and uh, reduce those cases uh, of uh, miscommunication between uh, whoever writes a function and whoever uh, calls it, okay? In, in other uh, more dynamically typed languages, these things uh, are many times caught only in runtime. And uh, uh, to a large extent, these uh, uh, features that allow uh, uh, overloading and choosing among, uh, among various uh, implementations, and maybe the compiler telling us where there's potential mismatches, are ways to reduce risk uh, of bugs and ways to try and make sure that uh, the code that I'm writing will actually uh, convert to the correct uh, binary with, that runs exactly as I expected. Um, and uh, obviously, this is mostly important uh, when working with libraries because whenever you know different uh, uh, people write different uh, pieces of code on different uh, occasions, uh, there's uh, room for uh, errors and for mistakes. Um, so, as I mentioned, overload resolution is the way to uh, for the compiler to help us uh, verify these uh, expectations. And in some cases, um, the compiler should be able to tell us that there's something wrong and give us an error. In other cases, it might just be that there are several uh, alternatives and we want to trust the compiler to choose the correct alternatives that we expected, okay? So uh, that's the basic uh, uh, motivation and the basic uh, uh, important, uh, importance of uh, these mechanisms for communicating between a library and an application. And uh, as uh, uh, we mentioned, um, 
uh, these are these can be important. In some cases, uh, you would want uh, the application to uh, to bypass the mechanism. You want the application to uh, uh, tell the library, yeah, I know what I'm doing. Okay, you know, C++ uh, is known to be uh, a language with uh, sharp edges, where someone that really knows what they're doing uh, uh, has a, can either shoot themselves in the foot or uh, get a, a major benefit, but only if they know what the, what they're doing. Um, but uh, and some mechanisms uh, allow these types of bypasses. Uh, while others uh, are less negotiable and are harder to, uh, uh, you know, to, to mess with, I guess. Um, so let's see how this is done with concepts. Uh, very much uh, uh, the way that uh, Bjarne uh, Strasrup uh, told us. Okay, this has to do with the requires clause. Okay, I talked earlier about the requires expression, which is a way to convert any type of uh, any piece of code into a Boolean expression. Requires clause is something uh, very different. This is what we put. Uh, on our on the object that we want to constrain, on our algorithm or on our class or on our uh, a variable even, uh, to say that it is only uh, valid uh, if uh, certain constraints are met. Okay, um, the requires clause will basically uh, um, be able to tell the compiler where is it allowed or not allowed to use a specific uh, template. Uh, there are two other uh, ways to write uh, uh, and, and constrain uh, our code to different uh, uh, concepts without using a requires clause. One uh, of the alternatives, uh, as, as I hinted to before, is replacing the word type name in the template with the name of a concept. Another way is uh, using uh, the, the auto keyword. So we can write auto concept and, uh, and, and use that uh, as well, similar to the way that we have uh, a generic uh, lambdas or we had generic lambdas before. Um, but basically, that's, uh, that's the main idea. If you write uh, a requires clause and constrain things, uh, we can basically help the compiler not instantiate our template where we do not expect it. Um, as uh, as Strasbourg mentioned, uh, in case there are multiple matches that uh, meet the constraints, the, the compiler knows to rank them and choose the best one, the most specialized one. Okay, uh, this, The exact uh, logic around it is not uh, uh, very, very trivial. You can see, look at the standard uh, and it's a reference for details. Basically, it has to do for whoever remembers uh, uh, or knows about uh, a little bit about uh, Boolean logic. Uh, it has to do with the conversion to uh, some standard form like a, a CNF or DNF, and then they're uh, trying to uh, to see if uh, two different uh, concepts or two different requires clauses are subsets of each other. And in that case, they tries to see which of them is is longer or has more uh, uh, more uh, true uh, sub expressions. As mentioned, the uh, concepts are SPINA friendly. In case of errors uh, or miss uh, or code that seems uh, ill-formed, uh, it will usually not cause a compilation error by itself. It will just uh, uh, deem the specific uh, object or algorithm that we try to constrain as irrelevant for that uh, specific case. Uh, the error messages are considered much clearer than uh, uh, SFINE and enable if and other uh, types of uh, of constraints that we had before C20. That's considered a very good uh, uh, motivation, a very, very uh, clear win for this feature compared to, uh, to other ways to constrain our libraries. Um, instead of uh, just getting an error message for some place deep down inside the library where, uh, for example, uh, there is an attempt to, to perform an, like a less than operator on, on two objects um, without clear indication of uh, why, it, it, why the less than operator is actually needed, um, with zero last 20 concepts, we usually get an error message about a much more higher level code uh, right around the uh, barrier and in the interface between the application and the library, where you can see that uh, uh, there's an attempt to misuse the library um, and, and not, uh, in, not in the way that it was intended. Uh, the compilation speeds with concepts are considered uh, much faster, and there are some benchmarks that show that they are much faster than other ways uh, that uh, have been used before to constrain libraries. And uh, um, in terms of uh, you know the, the responsibility of uh, of defining the the relationship between the library and the application, uh, when using concepts, most of the responsibility falls in the in the hands of the library. The library defines its requirement, okay, and uh, the application just has to conform. The application uh, cannot uh, uh, run the library with a type that doesn't match uh, the concept, and, and typically. Um, it has to uh, it has to you know do whatever it needed is needed to 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 get the the syntax right to to make sure that its types uh, meet the concepts. Otherwise, there's no there are no ways to get around it. Um, before C plus twenty, before concepts, we had the other ways uh, 
uh, to, to work in constraint uh, our expressions. And uh, here's a, a short clip uh, from uh, Timur Doomler um, from a CVPCon uh, about uh, uh, six months ago. I think uh, he also gave uh, this uh, talk uh, in meeting CPP uh, a few months back. Let's hear what he has to say about uh, uh, the older ways to uh, uh, constraint our functions and our algorithms. Let's remember if we, um, let's see if we can remember how to um, how to use that enable it. Okay, so you can write the std enable if uh, integral type and floating point type. Where do we put this? This is something that I can, I can never remember, right? So you can put this onto the return type of the function, but then you don't really see the actual return type anymore, so that's not great. You can put this into the parameter list, but then you don't really see the parameter list anymore. So I don't like either of these. Um, so my favorite method is actually to put this into the template argument list, because then you can still cleanly see the function signature. Um, so that's, I think, the most readable way of doing this, except it doesn't work. Um, because it turns out that uh, in C++, defaulted uh, template arguments are not part of the function signature. And then you again have the same function signature twice, and then you again get this error redefinition of function template. Turns out you can work around that because that rule doesn't apply to non-type template parameters, so you can make this an int uh, template parameter. Okay, I hope uh, this uh, wasn't uh, too long and too complicated, but my goal was actually to uh, let you hear all of that and to just uh, uh, get let it sink in that uh, the earlier methods of uh, uh, of uh, constraining our uh, functions were very very convoluted very complicated it was very hard to remember the exact way and the best way to to do it there were several uh, approaches some of them uh, seemed good but uh, didn't always work etc cetera, etc cetera. and the uh, concepts really alleviate and help all this uh, complexity so uh, and so as I mentioned, the concepts are a library-guided approach. The library chooses the, uh, the constraints, and the application needs to meet them. The same goes for uh, enable if. Okay, The library basically defines if something is relevant for uh, an integral type, a floating point type, et cetera, and uh, uh, the application has to uh, meet by those uh, requirements. And uh, for enable if, there is no uh, ranking. Okay, In case uh, uh, the same uh, algorithm, uh, for some reason, has multiple matches, um, for a class that I want to uh, to work with, then it will be a compilation error, and it's up to the library to uh, you know to put the correct uh, Boolean uh, algebra and Boolean logic to ensure that uh, there's only one uh, uh, one alternative that is actually true, that it actually passes the constraints instead of the others, because uh, there is no uh, ranking done when using uh, enable if. Another uh, approach that uh, existed and still exists. Uh, we already showed and talked about it, is partial specialization, right? With partial specialization, a library writer uh, can basically expect uh, that the applications will want to use the algorithm with different uh, types of classes, write their own, uh, uh, write their own objects, and, and the library has, uh, will be, be prepared with various uh, alternatives uh, where the compiler uh, can choose uh, the, the best one. Okay? Again, the library has to be prepared with the exact uh, specific uh, uh, you know, categories or, or types of classes uh, were, uh, uh, that, that uh, might be used by the, by the application. And the compiler does have a way uh, to rank among uh, several alternatives that are variable and choose the one that is most specialized. So partial specialization is, in some extent, similar uh, to concepts, but uh, uh, much less uh, verbose and with much less uh, um, power of, uh, of, of being accurate on, on the exact uh, uh, requirements themselves. Um, another uh, last uh, uh, approach uh, for library-guided uh, uh, constraining or communication between uh, uh, the application and, and itself is something that uh, we'll start seeing, I, I believe, in C++23 uh, with executors, uh, which is uh, what uh, Holman and Niebler call uh, behavioral properties, uh, things like uh, maybe uh, whether an executor is uh, blocking or non-blocking, whether it, uh, it, it runs uh, in, in parallel, uh, or whether it starts, it's greedy and starts execution uh, early or, or later on. Um, these are so these are various like, customization points uh, that uh, will be introduced uh, to the language with C++ executors, uh, where again the library basically defines some vocabulary, some types of properties that uh, it might support, and uh, 
applications basically have to uh, to adhere by those properties. Basically, have, have to if uh, if I want to write my own executor, I need to uh, uh, to, to make it uh, behave well with the various uh, uh, properties defined by the library. And if I just want to use an executor and and uh, and configure it in some way or another, again, I need to uh, to make sure or hold that the library gave me the facilities uh, uh, to use for that. So that's a uh, behavioral properties in the C++ 23. It's another way for communication. It, it, it's it's obviously different from uh, these uh, um, uh, from, from the methods uh, mentioned above, but it's still a way uh, for the application to communicate to the library and let the library choose the best uh, implementation for specific uh, uh, cases. Okay, another uh, approach uh, for uh, communication between the uh, application and the, and, and the libraries and about uh, and ways for choosing various algorithms and what to use is uh, a classic STL uh, approach called the TAG dispatch. Okay, what is TAG dispatch? TAG dispatch basically um, lets you uh, uh, divide the world of uh, application uh, use cases into different categories, okay, and, uh, and let, you, let the library implement uh, various algorithms per uh, category, okay, advanced algorithm from the uh, uh, STL, which takes an iterator and wants to move it forward n steps. Okay, if I want to move an iterator uh, n steps, I can uh, do it in various uh, ways based on the type of the iterator or the category. Okay, some iterators like uh, uh, random access iterators can be moved n steps with one single operation, the plus equals uh, or, or plus operator. Other iterators like input iterator or uh, bidirectional iterator have to be uh, moved n steps one at a time by using the plus plus operator, for example. Okay, and uh, this approach used by STL is such that uh, the, the exact uh, category is something that is, uh, uh, that is known or should be known for each and every iterator. Okay, and uh, the STL itself will call some inner function, the underscore underscore advance, for example, and pass it a third extra argument, which is the category. Okay, the STL implements different types of uh, advanced or underscore underscore advanced uh, functions. And the compiler will know to choose and, and call the correct one because of the different uh, type of the category that will be, choose, will be chosen. Okay, if uh, someone wants to write their own iterator, for example, they will need to uh, tell the STL using the iterator traits uh, spe specialization which category their iterator uh, belongs to. And that way, uh, communication between uh, the library and the users uh, can take place, okay? In, in this case uh, here, um, the iterators, as you mentioned, they can choose whichever category they belong to. The library itself has to uh, you know, divide the world into this uh, uh, closed set of uh, categories. And we can see that in the STL itself, uh, the dispatch operation is hidden, meaning that uh, this uh, third argument is, uh, is only an argument to the underscore underscore advance uh, a function, it is not an argument uh, to the actual exposed uh, uh, algorithm. This is an implementation choice uh, done you know, by the STL and by the standard. But uh, if uh, you write your own library and choose to use the uh, tag dispatch, you can also choose to uh, expose this uh, category uh, tag uh, as another argument uh, to your uh, public interface, okay, with some default, which should probably be the default uh, category of your own of, of the classes that uh, the user chooses, and by that way, uh, you can let uh, whoever calls uh, your algorithms uh, do an override. Okay, if if someone for some reason wants to advance uh, a, a random access iterator by uh, stepping through the items one by one, uh, they they could have done it if the tag was exposed in, as an extra argument, and this uh, override could have been done not uh, only for the entire uh, iterator type but even per call site. So if I wanted to call the advanced function in different places inside my code, I could uh, override the different uh, uh, choices that the, that the compiler does on, e on each and every site. So this is a, a tag dispatch. And uh, these, these are the last uh, alternative that I uh, can give you and can think about that, relate, that is controlled mostly by the library. There are also a few uh, uh, approaches that are more guided by the application themselves, where the library is more passive and lets the application uh, choose how to uh, uh, how to get things working and, and, and how to use the library. Okay, the uh, first of those is uh, uh, what's called a customization argument. This, uh, to some extent, uh, might be similar to uh, the exact uh, uh, notion of uh, commands and strategies that Klaus uh, 
spoke of, spoke of earlier, where uh, I write uh, an algorithm and I basically put a, uh, put a, a place for the application to plug in some functionality into uh, my, uh, my own algorithm, some, some strategy um, in, in some cases. OK, so here again, I can write uh, the max element uh, uh, algorithm that goes over a range and tries to uh, look for something that looks like a max element. And although we have a good default, we can also uh, let the uh, application choose and, uh, and specialize uh, some uh, subtle, uh, uh, some subtle uh, delicate points or, or the, the, actual, the heart of the way that uh, the algorithm uh, will, will run because uh, they can choose and uh, control the comparison operation. Um, again, in, in this case, similar to what we saw before, uh, this uh, override can be done uh, at the call site. So if I have uh, uh, my own type, I can either specialize STD less for it, or I can uh, uh, pass a, a different comparator in every, each and every call site to do different types of, uh, of comparison, different type of uh, uh, sorting. Um, another uh, application guided approach is what's uh, called the customization points. Okay, that's something that existed uh, to some extent uh, in the STL and in the language uh, even before C++20, but in C++20 with ranges, it, it received uh, even more attention. And there's also the notion of uh, what's called the uh, Nibloids and Tag Invoke. I won't uh, go deep into it, but uh, if you like, you can uh, click this link uh, once I share the slides and hear uh, uh, a longer uh, talk about that. And these are basically ways for, uh, um, for an, an algorithm or an application, again, to, to tell the library how to uh, perform various basic uh, operations uh, involving uh, the types uh, that are defined in the application itself. Okay, so the simplest form is just uh, by doing a uh, specialization. Um, so for example, STD swap. Okay, so STD swap is a, a, a standard algorithm in STL, and it is allowed for anyone uh, that wants to, to uh, implement and specialize STD swap for their own types if they think that they have uh, a better implementation or uh, one that is more suitable for their own types. It's, it's completely legal and it's called a customization point. Similarly, in uh, C20, uh, uh, the ranges library has a customization points like uh, S size, which returns the, si the signed size of a range, uh, empty, which will return a true or false whether a range is empty. Uh, and, and there are various other customization points. And uh, the tag invoke uh, uh, talk. Uh, linked here goes deeper into the ways to do it and ways for libraries that they want to do these customization points actually can uh, can communicate well with their applications and not uh, collide perhaps uh, with other libraries uh, which might uh, uh, want to uh, maybe take uh, and use similar names for different uh, uh, uses. So after having uh, uh, gone through many, many approaches, this is a short uh, uh, but perhaps a, a complicated a table to try and summarize uh, uh, all of that. We can see that there are uh, various ways uh, for library algorithms to interact with the application. So the first three are very, very similar. The library basically can either turn things on or off uh, in terms of uh, which application classes can be used with the, whichever library functionality. We can also use it uh, to choose from uh, a few different implementations. Um, there is no uh, uh, um, way to involve user code itself. The user just uh, basically chooses among alternatives but that cannot inject uh, code uh, into the algorithms, uh, into the library itself. And uh, uh, I would say that uh, specialization or process specialization and using the concept requires clauses is simple, whereas enable if is uh, more complicated and, and harder to, uh, uh, to use. In terms of the three uh, more application-oriented uh, approaches, as we mentioned, uh, um, the application uh, can ha has a, the ability to, to specify which uh, which uh, categories or which uh, ways uh, uh, they uh, it, its classes can be used with an algorithm, and in some cases, uh, um, user code can itself be injected into uh, the, the library uh, uh, inner inner uh, functionality. So this is a, a short summary. I know it seems uh, a little complicated, but hopefully. Uh, um, it gives you a little bit of, uh, of order uh, into the, the last few slides. This can be a good uh, place to uh, stop for questions as well, or comments. All right. We have one comment on the difference between concepts and Sfine. So somebody remarked that Sfine does not choose the most specialized thing. 
which I totally agree is, is, is correct. It's just much, much more difficult to have several things that are sphenate out. Yeah, it was just a comment. Yes, um, that's true. Then again, I'm bold to ask a question. You mentioned the performance, the compile time performance. Mm -hmm. Do you have any hard numbers? So something that you benchmarked on your own? Um, I did not benchmark it on my own. Unfortunately, uh, where, where I work, we are still not in C20. And uh, um, I've, I've mostly done the very, very simple things with, uh, uh, with, with concepts outside of work. Uh, but uh, I, I could probably uh, find uh, references for uh, you know other people's uh, talks uh, which, which did some benchmarks. And things are many times uh, quite uh, astounding. Okay, so it, it seems that uh, um, especially you know, there are cases where in order to do Sphine and enable if uh, uh, correctly, uh, you have to really create many, many different uh, objects in, in different layers, like uh, even like uh, uh, hierarchical graphs of, of, of objects, just in order to uh, um, to, to reach uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, final uh, conclusion, whether something is true or false, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, concepts uh, usually can, can be done much, much uh, more quickly, okay? And on top of that, the fact that uh, uh, the concept checking itself happens uh, earlier during the compilation, whenever, right before uh, starting the instantiation. Well, I guess that's also true for, for Spine. Um, yeah, I, I would say that uh, the fact that the uh, concepts uh, usually are, uh, you know, don't, don't require you to create many helper classes typically should help uh, the front end performance or the compilation performance. Okay, thank you. Okay. Great. And uh, regarding uh, the previous comment, it's definitely true. As you mentioned, uh, um, writing uh, Spine, the, with Spine, and, and I believe there is no ranking, uh, there, the, the best way around it is uh, for the library author to you know, design their own Boolean expressions such that they are mutually exclusive. But in case, of, uh, in case they don't do it correctly, then as mentioned, uh, you will get a compilation error. Okay, great. I should also say that uh, if I use uh, these uh, specific uh, approaches in sort of like advanced ways, you can uh, squeeze uh, a little bit of more functionality or squeeze a little bit of different functionality. I won't uh, go deeper into it, but I just mentioned that, uh, for example, with Tag Dispatch, as uh, we said, um, we can expose the categories themselves into the API, uh, into the higher level API of the library. And that way I can let uh, uh, different call sites uh, choose the, um, more specifically which uh, application or which alternative uh, of, the, of the library algorithm to use. Um, and there are ways uh, use it for enable if and requires clauses to also pass a little bit of the, um, of the decision into the uh, application itself. I will show a, 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 some example of that uh, uh, later on, but it has to do with the fact that uh, um, if, if my uh, constraint uh, has has some uh, Boolean expression that uh, an application is allowed to uh, to sub to specialize and override, then it can basically use that in order to uh, dive in and, and control my library um, in a way that uh, can sometimes be um, beneficial. Okay, so that uh, concludes uh, our our second part of the talk, talking about uh, overloads, and uh, the last part uh, is uh, a, a little bit uh, about uh, the semantics versus syntax and the certain pitfalls and things to think about and, and to consider when writing your own libraries or when using um, other people's libraries that has to do with concepts. So first, a, a few uh, motivating examples again from uh, uh, the standard, from the C++ itself. Uh, these are two uh, uh, um, you know, old uh, issues or bugs, uh, so to speak, that they existed or even exist until today in C++. I don't know if you uh, uh, know of these uh, two examples, but I'll, I'll share a little bit of information about them. So first of all, um, the type trait is trivially copyable V for STD pair of, of two ints, okay? So is trivially copyable is basically a type trait that should be true or false um, based on whether uh, the type uh, that uh, is, is questioned about can be just copied by doing something like a mem copy, okay? Whether the, the byte representation is something that can be moved. And if we think about it, we can, you know, know that the STD pair of a couple of ints is just a set of, uh, like, I don't know, maybe uh, uh, 16 bytes or, or eight bytes, depending on your architecture. But just, uh, you know, they should be uh, flat in, inside the uh, inside RAM, and mem copy should be fine for it. 
But uh, if you try and uh, look at the at the code, you will see that each trivial copyable V for STD pair is actually false. And uh, the reason that it is false is because of the syntactic requirements for this uh, type trait. This type trait is actually defining the standard not just uh, around semantics of is it okay to mem copy, but also around the, the syntax and the, the different uh, functions and functionalities of this class. Specifically, each trivial copyable V um, has to is defined based on the existence of uh, uh, default uh, assignment operators, default copy constructors, etc. And the uh, uh, STD pair, due to uh, uh, just historical reason, does not have a trivial or default uh, copy constructor and assignment operator. And for those reasons, it does not meet the semantic, the syntactic requirements of each trivially copyable V. Okay, changing uh, uh, and the, the, the assignment operator and the copy constructor for STD pair is something that is uh, ABI breaking, okay? And for that reason, um, the, the, the CPLPAS uh, committee is not willing to do that, is not willing to change the, the, the syntax and the actual, uh, uh, of the actual uh, constructors and, and operators for STD pair. And for that reason, is triple copyable V is still false, although semantically, it should be okay to mem copy it, okay? I should also uh, uh, say and mention that uh, uh, if I know that in, for my implementation, it is okay to do a mem copy here, it is illegal for me uh, in, in C++ to do a specialization and decide to specialize each trivial copyable V for STD pair of int int and uh, just tell the compiler, hey, it's true and, uh, and trust me, okay? Because um, although it's okay in general in C++ to uh, perform specializations on, uh, uh, on classes, uh, doing a, a performance specialization on type traits in, in the STL is something that is not uh, is not allowed, and it uh, uh, basically you know becomes an undefined behavior. Okay, the second example has to do with the complexity of uh, the size method for list. Okay, so STD list, you know, it's a linked list. The size uh, method of a list uh, should uh, return the, the number of elements, and uh, it seems that uh, until C++ 11, uh, the complexity was uh, it was okay for the complexity to be either constant time or linear time. And only in C11, uh, it was uh, uh, defined in the standard that uh, the complexity of this method has to be a, a constant time a, a function. Okay, and if, in fact, if you look deeper, you will know that uh, um, this change is, all, is also, uh, in some cases, an ABI break. Okay, and in C11, the committee decided that they are willing to. Uh, to allow it, and they made this change, which was an ABI break. And uh, if you are using uh, GCC, for example, you should uh, be aware that uh, in some uh, Linux distributions, the default uh, STI that you use uh, might still be the uh, the linear time implementation for uh, for, for this uh, method, just because uh, they wanted by default to not break ABI with older applications. So you might want to uh, check that thing. And. Uh, Another interesting point about this uh, complexity of size and the fact that it's, uh, it can be a tricky thing, I want to show you a little bit uh, uh, of, of a code snippet from a concept defined in C20, which is called the sized range. Okay, what's a sized range? Sized range is uh, anything that is a range. And also, here's a requires expression that uh, says that uh, uh, the size uh, uh, function or customization point can be called and is legal to call it. Um, for the range uh, t. And this uh, uh, piece of code is basically the semantic requirements, okay? Uh, or, excuse me, that's, uh, that's a syntax requirement, right? It, uh, it's a requirement that a concept is valid if I can call the size on it. But if we go and uh, you know, look at the fine print, look at the definition of uh, size range, we can see that there's another uh, requirement here that this uh, uh, call needs to run in constant time, okay? If I have a range where the size uh, function is implemented but doesn't run in constant time, then in fact, we are going into an undefined behavior territory, okay? And uh, we, we should not uh, do it. And because uh, I guess uh, the C++ uh, uh, standard committee thought that this can be risky and uh, thought that there might be uh, some edge cases where someone would implement a range with a size uh, functionality, which isn't uh, constant time and might uh, reach this undefined behavior territory, they actually defined a very special uh, uh, Boolean called the uh, uh, disable sized range. Okay, so disable sized range is a template that is always equal to false. And if you look at the documentation, you can see that uh, uh, if I write my own range, 
and for that range, I implement size uh, uh, functionality, but it is not uh, in constant time uh, uh, semantics, then I can, I can go and uh, specialize this uh, Boolean for my own uh, range, convert this into true, and, and by that, I will basically declare to the library and to the language that my range is not a sized range, although um, this, this functionality can be true. Okay, so this is an, what I would call an escape hatch, okay, a way uh, for uh, an application to interact with the library and say, yes, I know that the library has some syntactic requirements that are met, but I also know that my semantic requirements are not met. So I have a way, the library gave me a way to uh, break out of the syntax and, and tell you a little bit about my semantics. Okay, one thing that is uh, strange in here is that if you just look at the uh, definition of this concept, you don't see any uh, mention of this uh, escape hatch. You have to read the documentation to know about it. Okay, another similar example, but basically uh, the opposite, is the borrowed range. Borrowed range is another concept in the C++ 20 ranges. And again, it has various, uh, uh, it's, it's a Boolean expression that is rather uh, uh, long and defined things about whether um, the range that we're working with uh, owns or does not own uh, the, the items that it uh, can iterate over, or that it, it uh, basically is, is a view around. And here we can see that there is another escape hatch called enable borrow range. It is also false by default and should be specialized and converted into true wherever I want uh, uh, to use this uh, concept uh, uh, in my code. Here, at least happily, we can see that uh, this escape hatch is part of the concept definition. Okay, so um, whenever I write my own ranges, if I want to uh, declare that my range is a borrowed range, I, at least I can see it in the concept and I can uh, basically uh, go and, and know that I need to uh, specialize this uh, escape hatch in order to opt in and to tell the library that my range is indeed a borrowed range. So these are uh, examples of ways where uh, the library writer gave me some special power, okay, as an application to, to basically not forget about uh, syntax, but uh, uh, go a little deeper than syntax and tell the library a little more about my semantics, okay? So th those are, I think, uh, nice uh, examples of uh, maybe uh, delicate and smart uh, library implementations uh, that I many times think about myself when I uh, design my own template libraries and, and, and want to uh, consider cases where syntax is not enough and semantics also uh, need to come into play. Um, I have another uh, special example uh, uh, which is with a small clip, a uh, short clip uh, uh, from uh, uh, one of the keynotes on, on C20. It's rather short. Uh, I know that I'm maybe a little bit long in time, but uh, I think it, it can be interesting to look at. So let's uh, dive in. But now let's look at templates. Let's go back to a simpler version of the example with just one in parameter, but of a templated type. Turns out you have to write this nest of things. Okay, so this is uh, from a talk by Herb Sutter from CppCon. I don't want to dive too much uh, deeply into it, but I want to show you that uh, in this example, Herb uh, tried to show us uh, a way to use uh, the requires clauses and write uh, uh, three different uh, variations for a function. The function is called old in, and uh, there's, uh, there's a variation for uh, should by, pass by value, another for not should by, pass by value, and another for uh, 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 reference types. And then uh, one interesting thing to, to look at here is that uh, basically Herb uh, defined uh, this uh, Boolean expression called should, should pass by value V, which is a, a template. And it gave, it gave some uh, implementation uh, or some suggested implementation related to is trivially copyable, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, an interesting thing to consider is that uh, Herb did not uh, uh, use a concept for it. Okay, he basically defined this as a context for Boolean and not a concept. Okay? And one one should think, why did uh, uh, Herb uh, do that? Why did he uh, write C++ 20 code with requires clauses and still he uh, defined his, uh, uh, his Boolean is just a, an old uh, C++ 14 concept for bool instead of, uh, uh, of making it a full-fledged concept. And if you ask me, I think it has to do with semantics. Okay, I think it has to do with the fact that uh, this is just an, an initial implementation. Um, and this and this way, uh, anyone uh, would want to, to have their own class 
be uh, passed by value based on a different uh, uh, criteria, they can specialize and, and, and choose the Boolean to be true or false uh, for their own classes, regardless of this criteria. Okay? If you had the defined truth passed by value V as a concept, there would be no way to specialize, no way for the uh, application to basically override uh, the defaults that the library has set. Okay? So um, one uh, uh, last uh, uh, example where uh, semantics and syntax uh, can be a little tricky. And this is uh, uh, another uh, example from the, uh, from the STL ranges library. And this is a concept called equivalence relation. If we look at this uh, definition, equivalence relation is just equal to another concept called STD relation. Okay, and there's even a note here that says that the difference between relation and equivalence relation is purely semantic. Okay, so in terms of syntax, both of these concepts are exactly the same. Okay, the compiler cannot differentiate between them. Okay, if I want to write a, uh, an algorithm with two different uh, constraints, or two different implementations, one for any general relation and another for an equivalence relation, the compiler will not be able to assist me and choose the correct one. Okay, this is all purely semantic. And uh, this looks very strange to me, okay? Because I would assume that many times when someone writes an algorithm, they would use uh, uh, equivalence relation as a constraint, as a way to, uh, to basically communicate with the, uh, the applications that they, uh, the specific relation that needs to be used here is an equivalence relation and just, not just any general relation. And uh, unfortunately, with uh, C++ 20, the compiler will not help me if I just plug in like a, a, I guess a, a weakly ordered or strongly ordered relation uh, instead of, uh, of an equivalence relation. And that, uh, that is a little sad uh, from my uh, perspective. I would think that if, if it was up to me, perhaps I would try and put in some, uh, uh, some escape hatch here, some enabled equivalence relation or disabled equivalence relation uh, inside this Boolean expression to basically give some power to my users uh, to, uh, to, to specify or tell my library that something is an equivalence or not and give the, the compiler some way to alert and to, tell me, and, and to, to stop and tell me that uh, I, I might be doing something wrong, calling a library with an incorrect uh, uh, semantics. Okay, and uh, this is in, in my last uh, two slides. I'll try to give uh, some uh, example of, of how to do such a thing, uh, what I would call a uh, semantic sugar. Okay, um, and the thing here is, is, is basically a way to attach a concept, not just to a class, but to a lambda. Okay, so as we know that, uh, you know, relations uh, like uh, less than operator, equals operator, etc., are many times implemented as lambdas. And uh, this is a short uh, example, again, of a, a place where I would maybe want um, to attach some concept uh, into a lambda. Okay, so this example has nothing to do with relation. It has to do for, with a new concept that I tried to define for, for just for an example called critical code. And critical code is, for example, something that uh, maybe passed some uh, code review and we know is uh, uh, safer than any just any standard code. And then maybe I have a library that, calls, that, is called, that they can run things with high privileges and I can give it an operation, and it will run the operation. This might be an example of the uh, command design pattern that uh, Klaus uh, spoke of earlier on. Um, but I would want uh, this uh, uh, run with privilege to, uh, I would want the compiler to help me and not let uh, just any type of command, any type of operation to go through it, only things that uh, match the critical code uh, uh, semantics, okay? And the question is, how would you do that? Right? And, and uh, uh, I suggest, and I believe that there is a way to do something like a mark critical uh, component that I can wrap my lambda around. And obviously, if I have just some other uh, function object, et cetera, I could also use a mark critical thing uh, on top of that and in order to basically tell the compiler, hey, I know that this is uh, a critical. And if I write, uh, if I wrap my code with mark critical, I can later use some static analysis or just run a grep in my code to make sure that everything that's mark critical passes some uh, code review, for example, et cetera. And the compiler will uh, basically uh, stop me if I uh, maybe try to uh, run with privilege on something that isn't, uh, uh, doesn't, uh, isn't marked uh, with this concept. Okay, and uh, here's an, uh, the, the example, a very, very short uh, piece of code that shows how this mark critical uh, uh, functionality could be implemented. I, I won't go through it uh, too deeply, but basically uh, the trick here is uh, to have a template called mark critical, which is uh, 
templated on the, the lambda or the function object that I want to uh, um, that I want to uh, uh, to wrap, and I derive from it as well as from uh, another critical code tag. I use the using operator to expose the call operator of the object T or of the lambda outside of my uh, uh, more critical object, and this the fact that I uh, also derive from critical code tag will make sure that. Uh, uh, that uh, the, the critical code V expression will return true and my code will uh, uh, work and, and pass a, a compilation as needed. Okay, so that's uh, basically uh, my talk. Um, short summary is that uh, um, concepts are great. Um, if you want to use uh, requires clauses and requires expressions, you can use them even without uh, concepts. And if you're a library writer, uh, think about your users, think about the uh, uh, semantics, uh, think about the ways that you communicate with them. Uh, give the users the escape patches if you think it makes sense. Uh, consider letting them uh, customize things at the call site and not just per uh, class. And then if you are involved in the C++ standard, I would uh, um, maybe uh, think that uh, tell you that I wonder why it's not possible to do specialization for concepts and uh, for type traits as well. So this is my uh, talk. Uh, so thank you very much, and obviously uh, any comments or questions are uh, very, very welcome. So thank you very much, Roy, for this talk. We definitely enjoyed it. Um, you, you kind of started a, a little discussion in the chat about ABI breaking. So uh, uh, allow me just to paraphrase um, the comments. What, what's your take on it? Should we do a an ABI break in the upcoming C++23 uh, standard perhaps? Or not? Wow, that is a very, very uh, <laughs> tough cookie and tough question. First of all, I would like to uh, say, uh, in case you don't know, um, uh, there's a, a late uh, addition to CDPCon uh, 2020 that it was just been released a few weeks ago, I think, uh, a talk by uh, Marshall Claw, specifically around the uh, ABI and ABI breaks. It yep. also uh, talks a little bit about uh, uh, this uh, specific uh, issue. So if you want uh, more details, you can. Uh, uh, go and uh, listen to uh, to Marshall talk about that. I personally think that uh, uh, I don't know. It's I, th I I would personally prefer that they they will uh, have uh, uh, you know long in advance uh, a, a declaration of uh, ABI break uh, versions and, and do them like maybe not every three years, but allow uh, maybe an ABI break every nine years, etc. I think it makes sense, as, as, especially now that we have. Uh, uh, modules in the uh, in C++ in C++ plus plus I think it should be easier for a uh, uh, you know for versioning to take place to allow uh, you know different uh, versions of the same library to exist on a, on a specific machine and, and use modules and, and some build systems to compile with correct versions I think it makes sense to break ABI from time to time but I know it's a, it's a very delicate topic oh it definitely is yeah, some of the uh, um, of the C++ community is still struggling with the C++ 11 uh, ABI break, so it's not an easy thing. All right, thank you very much again. Um, it was a pleasure to having you again. So for everybody else, you are very, very welcome to join us in our after talk chat. Um, it's it's just your opportunity to ask Roy some, some direct questions if you have some. Um, we posted a link in the chat, so please feel free to just to join us. Else? We we'll see you next time at Mo Plus Plus. Um, have a good evening. Yes, Bye. thanks everyone. I will also post a link to the slides on the Meetup page, and I'm happy to to see you in the Zoom. And thank you.